every time the children went to their home, they would feed them full of just all kinds of nonsense and let them do anything they wanted to do, let them watch all kinds of movies, and, all, and then they would come back from that environment. And this couple came to me and they said, Jimmy, what do we do? Because legally there wasn't anything they could do. Hello, Marcella. Hi. Uh, just bear with me for a second if I haven't got the sound on. The sound's uh, if, on. If I haven't got, if you can't see me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, I've just got this video on, which I'm just going to continue sharing. Um, so that would just be creating the background, okay? Okay, yeah. And yeah emotionally damaged, you know, when they've had a previous marriage or previous relationship. Okay, you say you don't love them as much as I love them. You know, the greatest love on earth is a decision, not an emotion. I can choose to love your children just as much as you do. I can honestly say today, I love those kids like my own, but it didn't happen overnight. It's a commitment to a process. Can you hear the sound? A blended family, when, when you define blended Can families, you? it's a marriage where one or both spouses bring children with them from a... Can you hear the sound? Yes, really well. Yeah, it's very okay. clear. Okay. Previous marriage or relationship. Sometimes it wasn't a marriage. Sometimes it was, you know, an unwanted pregnancy that, you know, resulted in a, in a child or children or maybe multiple marriages or something like that. But there's a different dynamic to it. 50% of all families are blended families. And, but there's also higher divorce in blended families, which isn't necessary. It's really necessary because there are dynamics present day one in blended families that are not present in other families. And you know, I mean, there's enough risk of divorce in a regular marriage, but when you have a blended family marriage, we need to understand the special issues related to that. I wanna talk about non-biological parenting is again, and this is a very special challenge for blended families. And here, here are the challenges. Number one, the protective instincts of a biological parent keeping their child away from the step-parent. Now, this is one of the leading causes of divorces in blended families. The law of possession, the, there are four laws of marriage in Genesis 2, 24 and 25. For this cause, a man will leave his father and mother. That's the law of priority. Second law here, it says, and will cleave unto his wife. That's the law of pursuit. You energetically pursue your spouse. That's what cleaving means. And they two shall become one. Not 1 1.3 or 1 1.8, but one. And the only way that two things can become one is if you both surrender everything to the relationship. In Luke 14, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. Because anything we won't give up is an idol and it threatens the relationship. Okay, it's telling Jesus, this is more important to you. So when you come into marriage with children from a previous marriage, the non-biological parent has to share ownership in that child. They, they can't be on the outside. And I understand they're not the biological parent and they shouldn't try to replace the biological parent. But they have to be an equal. But there's just this natural thing that says, this is, this is another thing here, it's not trusting each other with decisions related to children or stepchildren because of favoritism, or you don't love them because you don't love them like I love them. Okay, well, let, let's talk about that for just a minute. Again, marriage is trust. And if you don't trust a person with your children, never marry them. You're making a huge mistake. But when you marry somebody, they become co-owners of those children. They have to have ownership of those children. And you say, but you become protective. And you say, well, you don't love them as much as I love them. Well, let, let me talk about this for just a minute. Okay, first of all, a lot of people are very, are very emotionally damaged, you know, when they've had a previous marriage or previous relationship. Okay, you say, you don't love them as much as I love them. You know, the greatest love on earth is a decision, not an emotion. 
Jesus said, love your neighbors, you love yourself. That word is the word agape, and that means a love by choice. I can choose to love your children just as much as you do. And what God's love is doing what Jesus would do regardless of emotion or circumstances. Let me say another thing. You know something? Your emotions actually may be working against you because of what you've been through. And the objectivity of the non-biological parent may be the best gift that God's ever given you. And when you take your children away from your spouse, when they should have ownership, Are you okay for now? Yeah, I was just getting into that. You're making everything. <laughs> really good. And even though they're a non-biological parent, and they may not have the natural love that you have, I agree with that, they can love your children by choice. That's the greatest level of love. And they can speak objectivity in your life. And I've seen a lot of divorces and blended families over this issue right here where one, one spouse says something like this, well, you may not be my spouse the rest of my life, but my children are going to be my children the rest of my life. And if it comes down to a choice, I choose my children. Okay. Well, I'll talk about that more in just a minute. It's a mistake. You have to share ownership of the children. Now, it may be wisdom for the biological parent to enforce discipline. That might be wisdom, especially in the beginning of the relationship while the non-biological parent is gaining authority. Well, that, that might be what, But the non-biological parent has to have full rights to that child. See, in one situation that there was a divorce, the children didn't want the new husband. They were loyal to their biological dad, and they didn't want the mother to get married again. And they tormented this guy, and he was powerless because the wife wouldn't let him have any authority over the children. And he was a good man. He wouldn't have abused those children. But he was just saying, I can't correct them. I can't defend myself. And she said, you better not. And he said, listen, these kids are disrespecting me, and they're making my life miserable. And she said, if you're asking me to choose between you and my children, I choose my children. And they divorced. He said, I can't live this way. I'm just, I'm vulnerable. And what I said to her is, one, the law of possession. If you didn't trust him with your children, you shouldn't have married him in the first place. But marriage is trust. So parent those children together. And those children need to see you operating as a team. They need that. An another, another issue of non-biological parenting is non the, the natural sexual barriers are missing. And that doesn't mean there needs to be an atmosphere of mistrust. You just need to understand, though, there is a natural sexual barrier biologically that when you have a step-parent in the family, there needs to be a higher level of modesty and accountability. It's not an atmosphere of mistrust. It's just wisdom that just says we need to, we need to wear robes more often. We need to wear clothing that's a little bit... Uh, you know, more appropriate and modest than we might. And there just needs to be a higher level of wisdom and accountability because that natural barrier is missing. Uh, child support. Let me talk about the law of possession for just a minute. This is one of my relatives divorced. Uh, she married into a blended family situation. And when she married into it, he was paying child support to his children, his ex-wife, the way he should have. He was a good man. This, this is a really good man. And every time they wrote that check, my cousin got madder every month. She, couldn't, she just couldn't handle the fact that this money was going to his ex-wife, and she picked up an offense toward his ex-wife, and it just tormented her until ultimately they divorced. Listen, the law of possession says your debts are my debts. Your assets are my assets. Your liabilities are my liabilities. And if you've got children from a previous marriage that need to be supported, I fully own that, and I will fully do that with a good attitude supporting you and your children. But she didn't do that. She would not assume the liability of him making that payment. And what happened was the marriage just tanked. It, it just went south. And so we have to understand that in marriage there is this law of possession. There's one other thing I want to talk about related to children is visitation. Children coming and children going. And this is one of the most agonizing issues I've ever helped families with. I'm thinking of one family in particular. And the, this was an ex-spouse that was spoiling the children and letting them have all kinds of, of exposure to ungodliness uh, with, with them and their new spouse. Every time the children went, and they knew it, and they, and they were using the children as weapons against them. And every time the children went to their home, they would feed them full of just all kinds of nonsense and let them do anything they wanted to do, let them watch all kinds of movies, and, and then they would come back. 
from that environment. And this couple came to me and they said, Jimmy, what do we do? Because legally there wasn't anything they could do. They weren't doing anything illegal. They were just being, they were playing the children off of each other and they were trying to spoil the children so they would be favored. And I said, number one, do not communicate through the children. Don't do that to those kids. You communicate directly with your ex-spouse and their spouse and don't use those children as messengers. Okay, let the adults do the communicating, not the children. Number two, every time those children leave your home, you pray over those kids. And you pray protection over their mind, their heart, their memory, their sexuality, their attitudes. You pray that God will go with them wherever they go and supernaturally protect them. Number three, number three, do not take for granted every day you have with that child and don't you play that game. You be righteous, you have standards, you love those children, you take those children to church. Regardless of what they say, don't be legalistic. Be fun and be, be fair, but you expose those children and do not underestimate the power of God to impact those children's hearts because righteousness is more powerful than sin. And they may be going into a home of your ex-spouse or someone and they're being exposed to all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God is more powerful than the Spirit of the devil. And don't let fear and discouragement get over you. You communicate to the adults. You pray over your children coming and going. And you don't lower your standards because somebody else has. They'll lose that fight. They'll lose that fight, I promise you. And when those children get old, the Bible says when you train up a child the way that they should go, when they get old, they won't depart from it. When those children mature, they'll bless you for your righteousness, and they'll look at this other person who is doing that, and they'll say, grow up. I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. But why did you do that when I was growing up? Why did you say those bad things about Mom and Dad? Why did you do those things? Why did you let me get involved in those things? You were supposed to be the adult. And they'll turn back to you, and I promise they'll thank you for what you did. You need to be fair. Don't be legalistic. But you just have faith in the power of God. I hope you enjoyed that teaching. You know, I love teaching two blended families because, you know, they have special issues. And you can have a very successful blended family. Half of all families today are blended families. And we know of many successful step families. In fact, we interviewed successful step families, and out of that, we created a resource called Blending Families. It's a book. It's also a workbook. It's also a set of DVDs. And we want to put these into your hands. Right now, for your gift of $25 or more to marriage today, we want to send you the book Blending Families. Now, this is some of the teaching that you heard today, plus it's the interviews, the excerpts of interviews from these step families telling you how they overcame their problems. We talked to them about everything that blended families face, the special challenges that they face, and they told us in this book how they overcame all the problems that you might face. And so you're going to get a lot out of the book. For $65 or more, we want to send you the Blending Families book plus the DVD set. This is them in person telling you in these interviews how they overcame their problems. For $90 or more, we'll send you the book and the DVD set along with the workbook. This workbook now is something you can go through as a couple. It's something that you can have a Bible study or a small group with and help other couples to overcome the problems of, that blended families face, the special problems they face. But listen, how to thrive in a blended family, how to have the family and marriage of your dreams, but to be able to deal with, to be equipped to deal with the special problems that you face. What a great set of resources we have, and here's how you can get them. If you have found yourself navigating through the unique challenges of a step family, then Blending Families was designed specifically with you in mind. You cannot just succeed in being a blended family, you can thrive. 18 successful step families join forces with Jimmy Evans in order to create a practical and biblical set of resources. I really had to realize that my husband is not my ex-husband. Well, the new parent coming in can feel as an outsider. It's not the same as your mom. I mean, I'm just not their mom. For your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the Blending Families book. For your gift of $65 or more, we'll send you the book and companion videos. For us, having a blended family is something that we treasure. For your gift of $90 or more, we'll send you the Blending Families book, videos, and workbook designed for couples, private study, or group study. Order today and set out on the exciting journey toward the healthy and happy blended family you always dreamed you could have.
gym is easy because it takes five to ten minutes a day. It's not that much work. You just have to want to do it. If you got five, ten minutes, you can change a lot in those five, ten minutes. Every other diet, it just says to you, you can eat this, you can eat that, you can't eat this, you can't eat that, and that's it. New Pelt me see that it's about what's happening in my head. I'd used a couple of apps before, and they never really worked. They put you in a good place to make the right decisions, and that's the tool you need. You change up here, everything will fall into place. Honestly, you know, how can you say you love that stepchild the same as your biological child when there's been so much more history? It would be hard to say that truthfully, um, but as far as your commitment to the best interest of that child with his kids and with adopting a son, you know, I can honestly say today I love those kids like my own. But it didn't happen overnight. It's a commitment to a process. I don't love my kids equally, but I love them individually. You know, I love them uniquely because each of them are, and I'm not just saying because one's biological and one's not biological. I love them all uniquely. I feel like it's across the board the same, but just in different ways because they have different strengths, different things that are about them, things that you love, things that you get, you know, it's just, I don't think you can love them. I think when people say, oh, I love my kids all the same, you don't. You love them all uniquely. If you expect to always have it be the same, then you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And if you expect your spouse to love every child and treat every child exactly the same, again, you're constantly going to be saying, but he's not doing it. Hello, Marcella. It's not possible. It's not possible. There are, even with my two biological children, like I cannot even possibly imagine being able to love them more, but I don't treat them exactly the same. Well, those were some great insights from our couples. And now we're gonna talk about discipline. Huge issue in any family. In blended families, there are some special challenges. We're gonna listen now to Charles and Ty talk about how they did some things wrong related to discipline. Listen to this. I know how my son feels when I discipline him. He's mad, he doesn't like it, and he loves me. And I've been there from the beginning. So imagine how a child is gonna feel when the step parent comes in and tries to administer discipline. They don't have the roots that I have, so it's gonna be war. So um, we didn't do this, <laughs> we should've. Um, we just kinda was like, okay, we all have equal power, okay? And he disciplined and I disciplined, um, but we found that the step parent just being the love initiator, just sowing the love seed, uh, really helps to nourish the relationship with the child to where they can grow to a place where the child can receive discipline. One thing that's important uh, with discipline is not only uh, my, my spouse and, and myself uh, being on the same page, but also uh, the, the child's mother, you know, or their father, the other, the other parents essentially, that they're on the same page because um, you want to let your, you want to let them know that this is how we're going to run our house. This is how we're going to discipline, um, and so that there, there's no surprises. We have been through situations where uh, one or the other of us was going to discipline one of the children, and specifically when it's the other child, the other's child. And when you when you see that happening and you don't agree with it, and you step in the middle of that, and we've done it, and it was not successful, um, you find that you're undermining, not only are you undermining them, but you're teaching that child lack of respect for the other parent. So while we would love, you know, I wanted him to be a disciplinary, I wanted him to be a father figure to my children. Um, there was a period of time where their father wasn't active in their life. And so I wanted him to step into that. On the other hand, if I stepped in and kept undermining him, I was just te teaching the children that he had no value. Also because of the different ages and the different backgrounds they were raised with, you know, that we have to use wisdom. You, you can't discipline them all the same. They all need consequences for actions, you know, if they do something that, you know, we need to deal with. But it's not necessarily going to be the same with each child because you have to know that child's personality. You don't want to crush their spirit, you know, and we want a positive result. We don't want them to do it again. I mean, so how do we get to that? Over the years as I've counseled blended families, you know, couples, that one of the most perplexing things that some go through is 
their children going back and forth. And when they go to their ex's home, the ex allows things that they don't. And this sometimes this can be really bizarre. The competition, you know, a, a very ungodly ex that just really allows the kids to do anything. And couples really grieve over that, and rightly so. And so we're going to talk to the couples now and let them tell you about how they deal with exes that allow things that they don't. We have to trust God. At the end of the day, when he's over there, it's completely out of our hands. It's in God's hands. You know, I used to stress about it every time he went over there. You know, what's happening over there? What's, what's he exposing her to? What kind of friends does she have over there? What kind of music? What kind of movies? What, I mean, all those type of things. But at the end of the day, we don't do those things at our house. He's there with us most of the time. We're gonna to continue to have positive reinforcement with him. We're gonna to continue to show him, hey, this is, this is why we do this. This is why we don't allow you to watch certain things. This is why you don't get to listen to certain music because there's a message behind it. This is why, so that hey, we're sowing the seeds now. He may not understand it all, but one day he will make that choice. And hopefully it's the right one. Code everything in prayer, you know, lift them up the whole time they're gone, before they go. Anything that you're concerned about, just encouraging them in loving ways without condemning the other parent. Address whatever the issue is that you need, that your concern is, you know, what, what can you do? What's an out? How can you, you know, if this happens, where can you go? You know, what do you do? Do you know how to call 911? Do you know how to call a friend or, you know, another adult that you trust and those kinds of things. I can give you instances where, you know, April's ex brought them to a, you know, like a party in Mexico and they're 14 years old, and, you know, it's drinking. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, this is real. Or, 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 you know, inappropriate movies or whatever. It's, that's where the control factor comes in and it's unfortunate. You, you obviously address that very strongly or, or, or well you, as well as you can to try to affect the other spouse. That's something that you have to do. But as far as the children, you just say, you know, there's a reason why we don't do this. And you, you look at it as an opportunity to talk to them about why we don't do this. Let me talk specifically about parenting. You know, over the years, I've helped a lot of blended family couples and deal with the issues of parenting. And obviously there are special issues there. And I talked about the law of possession and not just your assets, but your liabilities belong to me when we get married. God said in Genesis 2, they too shall become one. Marriage only works if you share everything. I mean everything. And anything that you will not share with your spouse will destroy your marriage relationship. It will. Children, See, sometimes there's this feeling that, well, my kids have gone through a lot of pain and I don't want to put, put them through any more pain. So I'm going to have to protect my kids in this relationship. And that's more important than the marriage. Well, first of all, the kids are going to smell blood in the water. Those children instinctively know that they have divided you and they're going to use that then to their advantage. And also many times to punish the non-biological parent because they don't want them around. They want their parents to be married. They're still loyal to their biological father or mother. And so your children need you to have be a united front. And the way that that happens is when you get married, you, you date to establish trust. There has to be a sufficient level of trust when you get married. You're not married still trying to figure out if you trust your new spouse with your kids. You've got to trust them with your kids. Okay. Doesn't mean they're the disciplinarian. You might want to be the disciplinarian, especially when the relationship is new, but you date to establish trust. And then when you get married, these aren't my children, these are our children. And I realize you may not be the biological mother or father, but you are a mother and father. In this home, you are the mother or the father that is my partner, okay? And so I, you have full ownership of these children, and so do I. So all of the decisions that we make, we are going to make together for mine and for yours and for ours. All decisions are made together, and the children cannot separate us. Once we've made a decision related to the kids, and there can't be preference, you can't prefer your children. There can't be things that you do for your child, your biological child, that you don't do for your non-biological children. There, in every family, fairness is important. In blended families, it's extremely important. 
There has to be fairness. There has to be equity. And the only way that you can ensure that there's going to be fairness is you make every decision together and don't let the kids separate you. If there's child support going out, I'm not, you're not paying child support for your child. It's our child that that's going to. It's not going to your ex-spouse. It's going to support our child. And the way you think about these things and the way that you do these things is absolutely critical. Listen, when you share ownership of the kids, the assets and the liabilities, and you share all decisions together, you can thrive in your blended family. Let me, let me give you this little formula related to your children. Because sometimes children have been hurt. If a broken marriage hurt your children, a healed marriage will heal your children. And so if once your children see you in a healed relationship, and you're able to love and guide and discipline your children from a solid marriage, that's where healing comes from. So don't forsake your new marriage because your children, maybe you're, you know, you're afraid about them or you're hurting related to them. Let them see you in a good marriage, and that will do a tremendous amount to heal their hearts. And I hope that that helps you. You know, we come to you to help you in your marriage and in your blended family. We go all over the world. We go across America multiple times a day, ministering to millions of people. And we can only do that because of the financial support of people who help us here at Marriage Day. Karen and I are asking you, would you stand with us financially? If you've been blessed by this ministry, the information is there on your screen of how you can support us. You can call us and give that way with your bank card. You can go online. The information is on your screen of where you can mail a gift. If you want to mail a check, you can do that. But we're asking you to stand with us. We, there is uh, just a war on marriage and family that's going on right now. And Karen and I, we're on the front lines. I mean, we are coming to you right now with this information, with ministry resources for blended families, for marriages, for parenting and all of that. And it takes money. And everything that we do is because of people like you standing with us. Please give your most generous gift right now. God bless you. Right now, less than half of adult Americans are married. Love in our society has become a very fickle thing and something that a lot of people say that you can't understand. You know, nobody knows, you know, about love. And if once you've fallen out of love, you can't get it back. I've lost 13 pounds so far and I'm only on week five. I've been doing it. As a couple, but also as a church and society, we need to work on marriage. We need to make it a priority in our lives. This is what we love to do in Marriage Today. We love to tell people God's plan for marriage. I just want to give you the good news. When God creates anything, He creates it for success. We believe that God raised us up as a ministry to make a difference. And as we grow as a ministry, we touch more and more lives. As those lives are touched, communities are changed virally. If you're out of love, you can fall back in love. If you've done each other damage, you can repair that damage. We're raising a biblical standard for marriage and helping people to succeed, and we need your help because this is what we've been called to do, but it's very expensive. Everything that you give equips us to go and reach more families, more couples, and to keep children together with their parents. If you believe in what we're doing, would you stand with us financially? Your generous financial gift right now is such a blessing, and really we can only do what we do because of financial partners who stand with us, people just like you. Thank you for watching Marriage Today with Jimmy and Karen. Subscribe to Marriage Today's YouTube channel for more marriage building videos and updates. Well, well, well. No one turned um, Did you find that useful? Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to give context to this session to everybody watching this. Um, this is our third mission and development monthly family life in mission session the topic is empowering strategies for lifting mindsets in children of separated divorced and 
unmarried parents. We just uh, watched a clip on blended families by a speaker, Jimmy Evans, uh, who is American and he comes from a faith background as well, Christian faith background. So uh, before we go any further, Marcella, it's lovely to see you. Um, thank you. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I am very well. Uh, Marcella, do you want to uh, set the context by sharing something from your heart and a prayer? please um concerning the videos we just saw you mean or uh from your heart so it doesn't have to be <laughs> um just just something that happened to me recently um with my own children um um as you know john um i had a family meeting last week because I was well aware that um, my children, especially my youngest and my eldest, were really suffering with hurt and trauma from my marriage breakup. That was 11 years ago. Um, and I've seen, especially more recently, the effect that's had on them um, in a really bad way. And I felt that um, I had to do something to kind of, um, you know, Help that situation, so I um, called a family meeting last week with my ex-husband and my two daughters, and just um, found it such a blessing just to talk about um, issues that my daughters were struggling with, and just to be open there to listen to them and take on board what they were saying. And I just want to thank God um, for being in that meeting and for the healing that He's starting to to bring to my children and just listening to that video there um made me realize the importance of um when another couple come together from a broken marriage and you remarry how important that relationship is to your children and um, especially the emphasis on um that the step parent has towards the children of their, their husband or whatever. I um, hadn't really looked at it that way. So you actually become a parent for those children as well. And um, I'll be honest, I never saw it in that way at all. I just saw them, oh, well, you're a step parent. Um, so that was interesting. and just made me realize something he said was about how the second marriage can bring healing can bring healing to those children and um, thought that was really interesting. Thank you, Marcella. Um, would you care to, um, since you've, op you've mentioned God, <laughs> would you care to open the session in prayer? Father, we just thank you. For Please. Father, we thank you for another time that we can have our family for them. Um, we just ask that you will be in everything that is discussed today. Um, we pray that we will encourage those who are listening, that we may um, give wisdom and, and guidance in some way. And we just ask that you will bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I want to uh, set the scene for this session and I want to go back to sharing something that I blogged uh, a few years ago uh, on YouTube. And basically that was my reflection when I was going through a situation which is the breakdown of a relationship. So I'm just going to read something and this was written uh, exactly 
10 years ago. So that was actually the 12th of August, 2010. So is it all right? I just want to read, read it. Is it okay? Yes. Um, what God has put together. So that is usually, uh, you know, what God has put together, let not man put asunder. And at the time when I realized I was faced with the breakdown of uh, marriage and um, I had to look at what was happening from my belief system, my theological faith belief system, my Christian belief system. And I had to look at it from other perspectives as well. And uh, as a healthcare professional, I started thinking um, about what happens when somebody is involved in a health crisis? What happens if they are involved in an accident? Am I, am I clear enough? Should I speak louder? Yeah. No, you're fine. Yeah, very clear. Okay. And so I'm just going to read what I wrote there. Uh, a, leg, a legalistic position is like this. It instructs, it, sorry, it, 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 insists, it insists on lecturing a motor accident injury casualty on driving skills. Does it make sense? No. Why? Bad timing. Because the casualty needs basic first aid, prompt emergency treatment, person may be in a critical state. Well, if it doesn't make sense to an accident injured casualty, it shouldn't be the approach used in dealing with a range of situations involving Christian living. Yet it is the preferred approach used within the so-called community of believers. When a brother or sister stumbles or falls, today I am highlighting this element in how separated divorced Christian couples are handled by other believers. And it's, I think it doesn't just apply to the Christian community. I think it applies to various communities. Uh, so um, I'm just going to skip a few things. The community of believers. Uh, so let me just continue. One illustration of a legalistic position. Uh, a and, okay, so this is a man, A, brother A and sister AI are married for years. They separate in the first seven years. The community of believers closely associated with their particular Christian denomination or community, I mean, it doesn't have to be the Christian community, uh, I would say the faith community hears about their situation. Immediately, a lot of pressure is piled on them with well-intentioned scriptural admonitions such as God hates divorce, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. And as if this is not enough, they are also made aware of scriptures such as he who divorces his wife stroke husband, except on grounds of sexual immorality and remarries, commits adultery. Incidentally, so this is, so let me just explain what I meant in that blog. I am not suggesting that divorce isn't a violation of God's uh, commandments according to the scripture. I'm not suggesting that at all. I acknowledge that based on the text, divorce, the breakdown of marriage, it's a violation of God's scriptural commandments. So all I'm saying in this 
is the timing. When people are going through uh, marital difficulties, when people are going to that, that seems to be the focus when people come to them. That's all I'm saying. So I'm not rewriting the scriptures to say that there is an excuse and that forget the fact that divorce, the breakdown of relationship, it's a violation, but I'm not taking responsibility from the two parties, the husband and the wife. That's not what I'm doing. All I'm saying is that when people are going through that, the focus should not be on that. The focus should be on the fact that the people are hurting. Okay, so I'll continue. Um, incidentally, that is the main focus of the admonishing received by folks who are on the firing line. My conviction is that simply hurling such scriptural admonition at folks who are experiencing a troubled relationship is equivalent to lecturing a wounded motorist about traffic lessons or driving skills. Now, obviously, the whole purpose of this um, session is the children from such uh, broken relationships. But I'm just setting the context of what the children often witness their parents going through. So their parents are juggling uh, with the breakdown of a relationship. And during this time, when the parents are juggling with that, um, they find that there is the added pressure um, of addressing theological concerns. And so the children have this pressure. They've got the sadness. They've got to deal with the sadness and the trauma of the broken relationship. And then the community surrounding them, uh, well-intentioned, the focus often is to add to that trauma the fact that something is wrong, they are doing something wrong, the parents are doing something wrong. And as a result, the parents, the children are dealing with two kinds of trauma. The trauma of the breakdown of the relationship and then the trauma of the shame that uh, sin has been committed and the, there is a violation, okay? Now, uh, welcome, Sally. We're just uh, having a discussion. Uh, and so I'm going to just uh, give a recap or maybe Marcella, you can give a recap of what has taken place so far. And then I'll continue focusing on uh, this subject. Um, before we actually started talking, John was showing us some videos about um, couples who remarry and children in um, brought into that relationship and the responsibility of the step parent um, to um, you know take full responsibility for that child as well and that how important it is that that relationship is equal um, the new space is seen as um, an equal and they agree on everything um, I think that was it wasn't it John John? Yes, that was it. I'll continue then. So continuing, I said the contest that children are dealing with, number one, all the trauma that is involved with sometimes the conflict that the parents are experiencing. And then the faith community who come into the picture, it seems the focus often is, and this is well-intentioned, the focus is on reminding the parents of their marriage vows, reminding them that they shouldn't break up the relationship. And obviously, the reminder is done 
using clear scriptures about how if they then go ahead and the relationship is broken and they go their separate ways, they would be confronted by, you know, the, the judgment of God, <laughs> the penalty, which it, it says in scripture. So children have to process all of these things. The shame that they are the product of a relationship that has broken down and also the, the guilt that not only is that relationship broken down, which they are product of, but there is penalty for the parents for the relationship because they haven't, the parents have not made that relationship work. Okay, today I'm not focusing on the parents. I want to focus on the children. And uh, to focus on the children, I am going to try and go to another um, another uh, blog that I did at that time. And that blog was basically at that time, I was trying to uh, bring uh, children, just trying to walk to the, the, the footsteps of these children, what they might be going through. So let me just try and, and get that, that blog. Um, but, okay, just bear with me. Let me just try and get that. Nah, just, for a few, just try and get that. Okay. So I'm just going to scroll down. Um, okay, just bear with me. Um, okay. So I think the way to do it is I'll go right to the starting. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm on the YouTube place now so John so here we are so what uh, so let's see. Okay, so I'm just going to share this unscripted because I'm not able to get this particular uh, blog. So I'm just going to come back, come out of this. Now, what is the mindset of these children who are product of a divorced, separated, or unmarried union. You know, one of the ways I have learned about dealing with what has gone wrong, one of the ways I have learned is you deal with what has gone wrong by highlighting what a good model or what is right looks like. So let's just look at the picture of children in general and uh, what looks normal. But before we do that, I think um, I've got a chat that I want to look at. Somebody has sent a chat. Okay, Sally said she can see me, but she cannot hear. Uh, I can so hear you. Sally I can is hear you. I've been following oh. for some time now. Okay. Now I can hear. Oh. Okay. Okay. So Sally, uh, do you want to come in? Because obviously not in my case, but you probably 
have a perspective to this just briefly before I continue? I just got in, so I don't actually know where you have reached. You are talking about the trauma that children, when they are young, is that not it? Experiences that yes. traumatize children. Okay, you know what the, the subject was, how to lift the mindset of children who have gone through that trauma. So empowering strategies for lifting mindsets in children who have, who have gone through to the experience of separation, divorce, and uh, whose families are unmarried. So it's all about strategies, ways of empowering them. So anything that you have to share before I actually continue, because I'm actually going to be looking at it from the positive side. So do you, do you have anything to share before I go on? We've, we've got about yes okay four i have minutes the, left. i have the yes okay uh i have had parents so, so we've had about four students. minutes left okay okay four i've had children left. in school i want you to continue and when we come back then i would i would uh just share what i was going to share so just between yes. you two i've continue. had children in school some were very violent because there was a, a one morning, a child came to school very late and she was just crying. I mean, this child was really very violent. So that day I said, what is wrong? And then she told me about how her father beat her mother. But the mother she was talking about in quotes was not even her real mother. Her mother had left the home when she was really very young. I mean, before one. So this other lady, the father got married to, was taking care of her. And she was about five, five, six. So that morning was she experienced. And I was really very touched. So, I mean, I could not help it. So I asked children in the class. I had Indians. I had people from almost all over the world who have ever had an experience before. And I was surprised that there was only two students who have not uh, really gone through this. All these young children at that young age, they have seen their mothers abused before them. And you see that they have some queer behavior. Either they are violent, either they are very stubborn, either they don't show any form of love just because of what they have gone through. So trauma really brings negative attitude to children. I've had uh, girls in church who have said that, okay, I want to get married and show men that I can also be somebody. I am a woman. But when you go through their life, you see that when they were young or one time in their life, they've gone through something negative. So they want to tell the world that, ah, we can also make it. So if I have something to share before you continue, I think... That is it. I've had a child too who never spoke at home. And when she came to school, after some time, about a year or two, she started talking. And we found out that it was because before she could even talk, the mother was really abused. Her mother left her. So it's because she was traumatized. That is why she could not talk. And after lots of coaxing, lots of uh, positive things. Finally, she started uttering words. So people that we are supposed to really address are parents so that they will know that everything they have, they are doing, their children are affected. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share. Okay, we've got one minute. And when, we, when it logs us out, when we end, Let's come back, if we can, at, um, at four o'clock, because that will give me time to, you know, save the recording. Is that okay? Okay, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Mm. So, Marcella, do you, we've got less than a minute. Do you want to quickly share your thoughts before us logs us out? Yeah, I'm, I'll just share a bit about my children's trauma from my breakup. Um, my eldest daughter.